Hello and welcome back to the GTN show. Yeah, welcome. There's been some controversy over some Iron Man finishers t-shirts and we're asking whether it's time to just simply stop the finishers t-shirt. Heart-hitting news here at GTN. We also have a zipper gate after a pro triathlete was DQ'd after finishing with their tri suit unzipped. And there's another pro triathlete who's been suspended for possession of an illegal doping substance. On some more positive news, though, we also catch up with Steve in our Hawaii Five O segment. Uh, he is just two weeks away from his Kona qualifying race. All right, kicking off as we always do. Things we've spotted on social media this past week, some fun bits here. Well, not so fun actually to start mm. off with, because this is something I've, I've got a big issue with. <laughs> Bar bags. Just, Fish, I mean, I, I get it. If you're going on some big adventure, absolutely. Handlebar bag makes sense. But a bar bag on your normal everyday training ride, not only on road bikes, but we're also seeing them on tri bikes, it's just, it's wrong. Mark, Mark feels quite it's strongly wrong. about this. He's referring, of course, to this post from Christian Blumenfeld, where he says, uh, never thought I would turn into a bar bag type guy. Uh, but he's got a bar bag on his back. Christian, what are you storing yeah, in what your is bar in bag? There? What is in there? And I, like, for you, I'm like, did you ever have a problem sticking your arm warmers, rain jacket, pump into your back pockets? Can't, food? Can't say I really ran out of pockets. No, I no. don't know what they're carrying. So what, why does everyone suddenly need a handlebar bag? Well, to be fair, we don't really know how long he was riding for that day. Sure so, <laughs> could have been a nine hour day or something. So, If you are a handlebar bar bag user, that's no why. I have a feeling Christian Blumenfeld's not going for nine hour unsupported uh, rods, exactly. so I really don't know what he's putting in there. But uh, Mark's got that off his chest, so uh, we'll, Thank you. well, yeah, okay. Next one, Gwen Jorgensen got a special gift this weekend at WTCS Sunderland. Apparently, she signed a cap for this uh, guy, and then he promptly came back to her and gave her his army drill cane, which is not something you see every day. <laughs> I wonder how much trouble he gets in for. I don't know. I think he's going to at very least get a bit of teasing from his army mates, if not some actual trouble from the army for giving away army equipment, which it probably is. Uh, anyway, uh, Gwen looked pretty chuffed with it. Uh, she asked him, uh, how do I look after this? And he said, just don't hit anyone. So I guess... <laughs> Low bar, I guess. Uh, pretty cool. Anyway, he was clearly a big, big fan of Gwen and, and uh, yeah, wanted to show his appreciation. Yeah. Well, also this weekend we had zipper gates. Matt Sharp placed third in Ironman 70.3 main, only to be disqualified very shortly after, all because he had his tri suit unzipped at the front yeah. as he crossed the finish line. Wasn't that zipper undone? It was. It was his chest yes. that was exposed. Yeah. yeah. Uh, otherwise, it would be a justifiable <laughs> DQ. Uh, but this is not really a justifiable T DQ. Uh, Matt, Matt Shop did say, really proud of my effort at 70.3 main. Lots of positives, especially uh, with most of my bike. Ended up finishing in third behind uh, the top two guys. Unfortunately, when I crossed the line, I was disqualified because my suit was fully unzipped. Uh, and I didn't know the rule that was on me to know it. I'm struggling because losing out on a podium is a big deal for someone like myself. Um, People have been sending me photos of other athletes and uh, Pro Tri News actually put a, a few posts up of other athletes crossing finish lines, famous finish lines recently, uh, where they did have their zippers completely undone and were not DQ'd, uh, including and it's, and it's Braden, Braden Curry, exactly. and it's, Lionel Sanders. And it's important to point out, I mean, no way pointing a finger at those athletes for having their tri suits undone, but they didn't get penalised for it. So it's, it, it just doesn't seem very consistent with the enforcement yeah. of this rule. I think that's generally the problem with rules like this, that if they're not universally enforced, then they shouldn't be enforced at all. You can't pick and choose who you disqualify and who you, you know, you can then argue that if it was a Lionel Sanders coming third there, he wouldn't have been disqualified because he's a bit more higher profile. Uh, and that's possibly the case because we can literally see photos of Lionel Sanders crossing the finish line with his tri suit undone and not being disqualified. So. It is uh, a bit harsh on Matt Sharp, and clearly this rule either needs to be enforced universally or completely scrapped. Um, I don't know which way I lean on that. I'd say probably completely scrapped. I mean, really, do we need to be... Uh... 
I mean, also, Just picky. also um, for the pro athletes, typically it's within their interest to have their tri suit zipped up because it's going to display their sponsors better. If they choose not to, it's on them, in my opinion. Yeah, and you um, also don't know the situation. I mean, maybe he was absolutely sprinting for that finish yeah. and you don't have time to zip it up. Um, generally, I was pretty good about remembering in the last mile or so to zip up my tri suit, specifically, as Mark says, for their sponsors because they spend money on you and you are their billboard and the best billboard is right when you're crossing that finish line you want it so i don't think many pro triathletes are doing this maliciously or in any way to try and make themselves look worse it is just the fact that they are absolutely finished by the time they get to the finish line and to then disqualify them after the fact just seems unnecessarily harsh yeah well we'd love to actually hear from you guys let us know in the comment section down below what you think whether we should get rid of the whole zipper rule or not Finally, we have also, well, not spotted, we knew this already, Sebastian Keenly is heading to the Norseman Triathlon this week. We're also heading there. I'm going to be actually filming, hopefully, with Sebastian and uh, John, who won it last year, John Breivold, um, who is actually the current course record holder. So it's going to be a really interesting dynamic to see Sebastian Keenly, a household triathlon name, you know, an athlete we would really expect to go there and rip it up against a guy that many of you haven't necessarily heard of, but is an incredible athlete on that course how they will duel it out, duke it out. What do you yeah. reckon? Perhaps a new course record upcoming soon. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to put that up there. <laughs> I think it's going to be tough. It's quite a unique event, but I, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I think Sebastian, if anyone's going to do it, Sebastian. Yeah, my um, money's on yeah. Sebi. Go yeah. on, Sebi. All right, well, stay <laughs> tuned, and we will have a video coming soon. Now it's time for Try News, and we're starting with the WTCS in Sunderland. Not the results just yet, but if you were watching the BBC coverage, you would have noticed that halfway between the two races they announced that there will not be a WTCS race in Sunderland next year in 2024. In fact, there won't be a WTCS race in Leeds in 2024 or in the UK in general at this point in 2024. Uh, this comes as a bit of a surprise because it's been quite a popular stop on the on the calendar. They did move it to Sunderland from Leeds this year, but the idea was that in 2024 we move back to Leeds where they have been hosting it for the last few years. Uh, the statement from British Triathlon read, the cost of hosting WTCS races has been escalating for several years. Following a detailed feasibility process and in consultation with all event staging partners, the challenging economic climate has meant that it would be not be financially viable for the event to take place in 2024, despite the considerable financial and value in kind commitment from Leeds City Council and UK Sport. Um, and basically, there's not been like an announcement like we're going to move it somewhere else, so we're looking for other venues to host. It's just been there will not be a WTCS race in the UK in 2024. It, it is. Yeah, obviously quite a shock and quite sad as well because um, obviously there is a little bit of bias. It's a, a home event for us. But that event particularly, it, it was quite an exciting course. I mean, the Brownies helped to develop and design it. So we had that very challenging start out of the transition. It was quite unique in some ways. Yeah. And I actually think that added some excitement to the WTCS calendar, a little like Bermuda did when that was on there. You know, there was something really exciting about the course and differentiated it. And so yeah. it's a shame to see that go. And also with that, I mean, Leeds is a Centre has just grown massively We, in terms of the performance and the athletes that are based there as a result of things like the WTCS event in yeah. Leeds itself. And the fact that the Brownleys lived there. But also, yeah, the WTCS race there has been a major thing. And as Mark says, it was a slightly different route. It was a bit more challenging. Than, and the, the courses have started to get a little bit samey. They're all kind of flat, slightly twisty five lap, eight lap bikes and, and four lap runs. And Leeds was, was one that stood out as, you know, it's got a punchy climb in it, etc. And to see that go is quite disappointing. It may not be the end of WCCS racing in the UK. Uh, British Triathlon have said, hosting major events remains a part of British Triathlon strategy and the organization is working with its partners, including Leeds City Council and UK Sport, to explore different ways to enable a return of a WTCS event in future years. But obviously they're talking 2025 and beyond there, so definitely not in 2024, which is a bit disappointing. Uh, Alistair Brownlee, Tim Don have weighed in and also gone. It's, they are quite disappointed by this, uh, and we are too, I think. Yeah. Uh, hopefully it is replaced on WTCS calendar with another exciting venue and challenging course somewhere else in the world for 2024, and hopefully it does come back to British soil in 2025. Yeah, we also forget the power of actually being able to showcase these very high level athletes, and particularly for our British athletes, showcasing them in front of the kids, the young yeah. athletes. That, And I've heard countless stories on, of 
you know, genuine stories from kids saying, I watched a WTCS event in Leeds and that inspired me to become a triathlete, get stuck into TriStar yeah. events that we have here in the UK. And for me, that is what it's all yeah. about. It's and a bit more personal sense. when it's on streets and roads that you recognise and mm. you know and look, you know, they're British, so you, you, you understand that this is something that you can aspire to. It's, it's here as opposed to something you just watch on TV. So, yeah, it is uh, it's frustrating, uh, but yeah, fingers crossed. And that does actually lead us on to our next point in the news. It does, because Ironman have announced a discontinuation of Ironman Montreblanc after this year's race in 2023. Now, since 2012, Montreblanc has been a very popular race destination for the Ironman. In fact, they used to have near to 3,000 athletes. Back in 2019, they had 2,700 athletes. But since the pandemic, they've just struggled to get those numbers back. And actually this year, or sorry, in 2022, had a little over 1,000 athletes taking part in the event. And as a result, have decided to cancel the future. Yeah, and we actually spoke about race cancellations last week when we spoke about Ironman Lanzarote being potentially on the chopping block because they only had 867 competitors uh, this year and it, nothing is signed for the following year with Club La Santa to host it uh, and there may not be an Ironman Lanzarote which is one of the staples on the calendar. Ironman Bolton in the UK is also known no more. It will be reduced to an Ironman 70.3 uh, where Ironman 70.3 Staffordshire is also no more which we also spoke about last week. On top of that Ironman Coeur d'Alene uh, is, is also not happening next year and Ironman Tulsa is also not happening next year so Ironman is doing a big consolidation of their whole calendar around the world and we are, are not privy to all the details of of entrant numbers for all these races so we can't really tell you whether this is just because there's no one signing up or whether it's just actually just Ironman consolidating they want bigger better races so they're going to do a few less we don't really know but it does look like a bit of a trend in the world of triathlon and not a very positive trend. Well, moving on, and there has been a bit of controversy after Ironman 70.3 Swansea when some athletes realised that the finisher t-shirt they received from the event was simply a repurposed t-shirt from the previous year's race. And how they repurposed it is by literally whacking a 2023 sticker over the top of the 2022. Now what happened in defense of the event is that they received a batch of t-shirts, I think it's around 2,000 t-shirts late for last year's event and therefore decided to repurpose them. I guess they thought they were being rather smart and creative but unfortunately some athletes were up in arms because they paid good money to do this event and they wanted to finish a t-shirt and felt it was a bit of a cheap cop. Yeah, the argument was of course sustainability. Uh, all those 2022 shirts, all 2,000 of them, are just going to go to waste to a landfill probably and they can repurpose them. You still get a t-shirt, you can still walk around with it and it says 2023 Ironman finisher. So what's the problem? Well, they didn't go so far as just use a permanent marker and change it to 2023, but they did They did it as professionally as they could. But you can uh, see the 2022 quite clearly underneath the 2023 and people were not very happy with it. And I kind of understand it. If you yeah. went there for a, for a t-shirt and you are one of these people who actually does want to wear your t-shirt and does wear your t-shirt for many runs in the future and many events in the future and you're very proud of your achievement, as you well should be, you want your t-shirt. You don't want to repo. It almost looks like you didn't do the 2023 <laughs> event. You just uh, changed it yourself. To you know, Every year you can just stick a new sticker on and you have no, wow, you finished so many of those. It's, uh, bit, it's a bit like your uh, swimming towel back in the day and you get the new badges and you add it to it. Yeah, you yeah. Know, just keep well, adding then, a number on top. Which brings yeah. us to the, to the topic at hand because it got us talking about do we really need finishers t-shirts? Now, we've actually entered a few races recently, Mark and myself, and... A lot of them give you that option of a, a tick box on the entry form where it says, do you want your t-shirt or would you rather we planted a tree on your behalf? And I think we would rather they planted a tree on our behalf. And I think many people do feel like that. However, there are some people who are absolutely adamant that they need a finishers t-shirt. And I can see why. But I mean, is there a better option? I mean, that's, this is the thing. I, I, I think this is why I'm sort of on the fence about their actions. Because for me personally, I, I, I applaud them for what they did. But as you say, James, I think a lot of people, they're so much uh, caught up in that T-shirt and prestige and wet being able to wear it that it, it has some significant significance and importance. So if we were to get rid of the T-shirt and look at a better alternative, 
what would we do? Well, the argument really is that your medal is the commemoration thing, and you know yeah. you can have an awesome medal hanger like we have there, and you can hang up your medal and, and show it off, but obviously you can't really wear your medal to the shop. That would be <laughs> weird. <laughs> but what can you have to commemorate your finish that isn't a T-shirt, that is more usable potentially? You know, I mean... What's the best thing you've ever let's been? Let's be honest, finished t shirts a little bit garish. Well, you don't really want to wear well, them Well, my dad, my dad loves wearing a finished T-shirt. Uh, I, a lot of finished T-shirts that he's not even done. Yeah, I was going to say, my but dad is very a, similar. A, lo- a lot of my finished T-shirts do just become rags for cleaning the bike, which I guess they've... They have a purpose, so they're not completely wasted. Well, yeah, but, but the problem with really... the draft ones is you can't really. Yeah, you need a cotton one for that better, too. Oh, yeah, exactly. What's yeah. the best thing that you've ever got? Mm, I don't know. Beer mug's pretty useful. Like, a, you do yeah. tend to use it, and every time you pick it up, it's got the engraved. You know yeah. what year you finished and everything until your kid breaks it. I, I used to like getting towels because I would genuinely use them, but. I guess a bit like the t-shirts. There's only so many towels that you need after yeah. a while. <laughs> well, I'm not sure many people do as many races as we do. But True. yeah, a towel would be more useful. I think we also came up with the fridge magnets because you can have quite a collection of fridge magnets. And it's not going to take up too much space. Yeah, you can put them in your pain cave where you, we, they, you know, they don't have to be on your fridge in your, in your, uh, in your, in your uh, kitchen where your wife is going to get I mean, annoyed. Someone also suggested a water bottle. And just to point out here, I mean, they're not necessarily any more sustainable than a t-shirt, but they actually may get used, and therefore that's you know that yeah. eradicates that issue. Yeah. Um, we've got socks, um, bumper stickers, a cap. But I guess that you know when you start mm. to mass produce a cap, the quality yeah. goes down. Yeah, much so. like finish just t-shirts, and you have the same issue. Yeah, definitely not a bag because they Ooh, yeah, are no. just always rubbish. They fall apart, don't they? Yeah, they so. just don't last very long, and they are creating a lot more waste than those t-shirts. Maybe it should uh, just be a high five. High five yeah, across maybe. the finish line, that's what you want. Just a photo and a memory. Yeah. What, what should it be? Let us know in the comment section down below. Or if you absolutely want to finish a t-shirt, yeah, let us know that too. Yeah, well moving on, and Gustav Eden is not doing the Paris test events. The Norwegian Federation have picked Kasper Storners over Gustav Eden for the upcoming Paris test event next month. Now, despite being the reigning Ironman World Champion, Gustav has actually decided to pass on this year's Ironman World Championships, although you could even argue that the event has probably got his name written all over it, and decided to focus on qualification for the Olympic Games. Yeah, which makes this quite striking. I mean, Christian Blumenfeld and Gustav Eden get a lot of the press when it comes to the Norwegians, uh, for obvious reasons. Mostly Christian Blumenfeld is, you know, Olympic champion and Ironman world champion, and Gustav more for long course, but there's also Kasper Stornes and Vettel Thorne also vying for those potential three slots for the Paris Olympics 2024, and they only have three slots for the Paris Test event uh, coming up soon, and they've passed over Gustav uh, for this one, which is, as Mark says, when he's already given up going to world champs in Ironman so that he could get ready for Paris, and now he's missing the biggest test event, get ready for Paris event. Uh, it's quite striking. Uh, he did announce though in May that his mother had, after a very brave battle with cancer, passed away and he struggled a little bit with that. He said, it has been really hard to try and live a high performance life and race around the world when the hardest battles have been fought at home. For now I'll take some time off with my family. And he did take some time off and he has been a bit quiet on the racing front, but he did come back uh, to race the WTCS Montreal, which he described as his most emotional triathlon ever, uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, and WTCS Hamburg, he finished 32nd and 57th in those, so not uh, outstanding. Um, but uh, he currently stands 72nd in the world rankings. And Norway have obviously looked at that and gone, we have to give it to Kasper Stornes and Vettler Thorne rather than Gustav for this Paris test event. Because as it stands right now, just straight up on the merits of your of your results, uh, they deserve the slots more than he does. Yeah, and then after Paris, obviously Gustav has a chance to redeem himself a bit with the plan to race WTCS Grand Final in Pontevedra, again, if he gets a spot, and in several World Cup races through October and November, the aim to collect his World Triathlon ranking points and potentially get himself high enough to vibe for that position for the Olympic Games. And also, Norway actually are up against it to try and get that third spot for the men as well. So there is actually quite a lot at stake here for 
not just Gustav, but all of them really. Yeah, if you don't know how it works, uh, most countries get two slots for the Olympic Games and then a certain number of countries, depending on the ranking of their athletes, and can get a third slot, qualify for a third slot for the Olympics. Uh, Norway, as it stands now, will get two slots. They may get three if enough of the athletes can get high enough up the ranking. So it's quite important, not just for Gustav himself to get his ranking up, but for Norway as a whole team so that they can get three full athletes on the start line in Paris 2024. Uh, so yeah, there is a lot riding on it and he does have his work cut up for him, but he does have a few races, World Cups later in the year to get that ranking a little bit higher. Yeah. Uh, moving on and to some, well, not great news. Uh, Austrian athlete Thomas Steger, um, who races for the Payback Triathlon team, has been handed a suspension from triathlon from racing. Um, he was actually handed a four-year ban and he has managed to uh, battle that and bring that down to just a year. And this was handed to him for possession of prohibited substances. Yeah, uh, it's a bit of an interesting story. I mean, initially on the surface of it, you just go, well, I mean, he had banned substances. He's got a ban, end of story. Uh, at least they caught another one. But uh, he tells a different story on his Instagram where he says he's a fair athlete um, and his life's been turned upside down since 2021 when he started fighting this. Uh, basically, someone tipped off the uh, anti-doping authorities who raided his house, found uh, used uh, inhalers for asthma in well, his actually, house. Well, actually, originally, it's, it's gone on for quite a long time for him. Since 2021, they raided and took all his electronics, essentially, and then oh, yeah. came back the following year and that's when they took the inhaler. So it's just, yeah. it's been quite a drawn out process for yeah. him. So they, they searched his house and found these inhalers who he claims were from his dad's practice and he still lives with his parents, so that's why they're in the same house he was in. Uh, and he definitely hasn't done anything and he wasn't tested positive or anything like that. Um, he appealed, got it reduced down to a one year ban, which he will, has served retrospectively and therefore he will actually be allowed back in to racing from, uh, is it the 6th of October, I think this year? Um, so he's, his band's pretty much already up from October, but obviously since 2021, he's been fighting this and really had his head, his life turned upside down for a professional athlete. But he also posted that he's got a VO2 max of 92. <laughs> going to say which is, I mean, 91.5 is his VO2 with a peak of 92.6. Um, <laughs> I mean, uh, you wonder why his house was raided by the yeah. anti-doping authorities, but and, uh, when you're posting those kind of things on social media. And, uh, you know, he hasn't helped himself by the certain athletes that he's hanging out with and training with. Um, so, yeah. Mm. I want to I want to <laughs> believe it's not true and believe his story, but, yeah, it's um, yeah, not great for, not the, great, no. for the world of triathlon. Um, anyway, moving on and to some more positive news. Um, it's been a little while so, since we've spoken to Steve McKay, our athlete here who has turned 50 in the GTN HQ and is vying for a qualification and spot for the Ironman World Championships uh, as an age group, but not a pro. He's uh, not stepped up quite that quickly, sadly. Um, but last time we caught up with him, he was yet to do his Challenge Wales race, which was a middle distance race. And then obviously he was building up to his big race, which was Ironman Cork, where he was aiming to qualify and through all of this he's been using Humango an AI training platform which has been setting his training and listening to him and the training that he's been doing and then adjusting it as he goes so it's been really quite smart and I know it's um, made life a lot easier for him um, as well as a little bit of support from us guys yeah we have been trying to help him as much as we can with various things along the way and pretty much it's all done and dusted now because he's two weeks away from that qualifying race in Ironman Island so we're going to check in with him and see how he's going. Hello Mark, hello James. You've just caught me uh, watching this excellent video from uh, GTN on uh, swim strategy so um, really well planned, very well timed so thank you for that. Bit of an update from me. I don't think I've spoken to you properly since Challenge Wales which is a couple of months ago but um, yeah, I've had some pretty pr pretty sort of good lessons from that whole experience. Uh, the main one was hydration. I managed to, uh, the ultimate rookie era, run out of water. Uh, so I've actually got these big boys from uh, Precision Fuel and Hydration, big litre bottles. I've got two of those, so hopefully that will solve that problem. Uh, the other disaster was my uh, knee strategy. So, so applying tape during transition two. Uh, didn't work, uh, so I'm not doing that again. 
Uh, it just, it, I ended up spending six minutes in transition uh, for the tape to fall off. So uh, after about a kilometer. Um, what did I learn from that? I mean, what's strange is Mark has actually uh, sort of told me that sometimes that can happen. And, you know, the shock of the, the race or the intensity of the race just somehow corrects any issues, which is great if that's the case. Um, I guess we'll find out uh, because I'm not going to, I'm probably going to use some different tape or maybe some waterproof tape before I even start on Man Cork. Um, so, yeah, we'll see. Um, in between Challenge Wales, I've had a few, uh, well, lots of kind of life things happening. Um, went to Glastonbury Festival, which was amazing. So it was a perfect little rest week after a couple of weeks after Challenge Wales. Um, what else happened? My daughter finished school. Uh, so she's having now the summer of her life, as you do when you're 16. So that happened. And, and yes, yeah, training-wise, just looking at Humango, We've got, delighted to say that there's a kind of two week dip now before Ironman Cork. And so I guess the intensity and the uh, volume is gonna reduce. Had a big weekend, just gone, uh, big ride, five and a half hours, big swim, full full Ironman distance swim actually, which went really well. Um, I, was saying to, I was saying to Mark, you, you know that um, I was feeling a bit lethargic and I feel a bit sluggish about everything, but Apparently that's my um, sort of fatigue building. So this is going to give me an opportunity to kind of just recharge the batteries. Um, it's worth saying that Huma uh, for Humango is that what's been really good is that I don't have to think about this. I can just literally roll out of bed and just go off and do the do the exercise. All I'm going to do is turn up in the right kit, which sometimes is a challenge, but um, but generally it's it's pretty good. Um, and then I think that's pretty much it in terms of uh, updates. Uh, I've got two weeks until Ironman Cork. Um, otherwise, that's it. I will definitely be in touch with probably both of you independently with last minute panicky uh, real rookie questions uh, in the build up. And otherwise, I will do another update before the race and then hopefully do one after the race. But uh, otherwise, I will catch up with you soon. See you later. Now it's time for What The Tech. And this time we've got a collaboration between Form, those are the smart goggles, and Training Peaks. And this is quite interesting because Form claim now that after eight weeks of beta testing, you can now link your Training Peaks to the Form and it will interpret your workout from Training Peaks and present it to you in your goggles while you're swimming. And not just a built workout, like you know, you build it in the train the, the workout builder in Training Peaks, which is quite complex to do. It's gonna interpret just what you type in the description box for your swim from all coaches. And we all know that all coaches use different lingo and different shorthand yeah. for their swim sessions. And I've got to say, I haven't seen this in action. I can't actually see it working. And I'm saying this. <laughs> My wife is a coach, a pretty good swim coach, and I struggle to read and understand so what you're her shorthand on her swim, and I find it very hard to believe that Form is going to be able to So what you're saying it. is Form should have employed Jody to uh, basically test the software. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. If they can interpret Jody's swim sessions, they could do anyone. <laughs> so maybe that's what they should do. It. I mean, she wasn't included in the beta testing, but maybe she should be. But if this does work, this will be very impressive yeah. and, a, and quite a useful tool because let's be honest, that is quite a difficult part of swim training where you go to your training peaks that your coach has set you something and you get a little piece of paper and you write it all out to so stick it next to the pool or put it on your water bottle so that you can take it with to the pool. Uh, now you'll be able to literally just connect that to your training peaks and hop in the pool and it would say swim 200 and then 50 meters easy and then 50 meters kick and etc. It'll all be built into your goggle just from interpreting that text box, which sounds absolutely brilliant. I'm just a bit skeptical as to whether it would work with uh, all coaches. It's very clever. I yeah. mean, let, let's face it, I mean, writing a swim worker or building that in the Training Peaks Workout Builder 
It'll take you a lot longer, I yeah. think it would for me personally, versus making a run or bike workout. There's so many, often in a swim workout, there's so many little bits and little reps of four lots of 50, and yeah. it'll, it'll take you ages. So actually, really? if you can do this, it's incredible. Uh, yeah, it's game massive. changing. Wow. Absolutely game changing. <laughs> I, I, just I, can't don't, I just don't think it can read my, my, my wife's short end. <laughs> anyway, moving on. Uh, enough of uh, Jodie. Hope she's not watching this. Um, we've also been made aware of this fun study, if you can call it that, from a website. What website were you on, Mark? Um, E-bikes org. Pardon? What was that? Ebikes.org. Ebikes. What were you doing on that <laughs> website? I know, I know. I know. Uh, hear me out on this one, though. It's quite fun. So basically, what they've done is they've compiled the most popular music that's been listened to on Spotify by searching through playlists that use the names running, cycling, bicycling, spikes, you name it. You kind of get the idea. Yeah. Um, not very scientific. It's ebikes.org, though. So, yeah, like, I, the number I mean, one song is going to be. Um, I, don't say, don't, no, don't say don't. <laughs> well, funny you should say that. Uh, I know this isn't very scientific, um, but Taylor Swift is on the list. It is, but yeah. actually for running, not oh, for cycling, interesting. not for e-biking. Um, so, what is interesting? So, number one song for cycling is "Thunderstruck" by ACDC. Wow. Actually, ACDC yep. one and two, "Highway that. to Hell." Yeah. Um, uh, well we've done. got. And it's very. It seems very rock heavy. Actually, yeah. if you look at the top sort of twenty five there. It's very sort of rock heavy. Whereas when you go to the running side of things, it's a bit more kind of pop dance sort of. We've got Taylor Swift, Shake It Off in number three. Macklemore, Can't Hold Us, number one. Um, Interesting. Kanye West, Stronger. Uh, it's actually quite a lot of similarities to CrossFit. Oh well, no, I lie actually, there's not, is there? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, we'll get onto that topic. As what? I say, very scientific <laughs> study. Yeah, yeah. Um, so with cycling, the it's 25% is hip hop and rap, 23% rock, 16% pop. Whereas for running, it's a complete shift. We've got 30% pop, 21% hip hop rap, and then it's dance, EDM, 15%, and rock down at 14%, 6% metal. So yeah, very What would you listen to, Mark? I'm more of a rock guy, but not, I do like it's a bit, I, I'm yeah, quite diverse. Not, not classic Disney songs. <laughs> Does sometimes happen. <laughs> I do have a shared Spotify with my. Uh, my I definitely, so. I definitely be in the rock category, particularly eighties rock. I think would oh. probably be my uh, my top playlist. I, don't know. I thought seventies. You did. And now it's time for your race news. And we had a big race, as we mentioned earlier, at the WCCS in Sunderland. And uh, it was pretty much an all-French affair, despite happening on British soil. Uh, in the men's race, Pierre Lecour took the win in a sprint finish against his country mate Leo Berger, with Hayden Wilde rounding out the podium in third. Hayden Wilde actually went out uh, on the start of the run and put about six or seven seconds into everyone, and it looked like it was his race to lose at that point. I mean, he is arguably the strongest runner in that field, but the French were having none of it. They are definitely stamping their uh, authority at the moment on the WTCS series in the lead up I'm to Paris test event, which is in the lead up to Paris 2024. I must so. admit, I didn't actually get to catch the race, but I saw a clip of them coming to the finish line. The French boys, my goodness, they managed to descend well there and they yeah. just gapped Hayden. There was a very interesting sprint finish too because they had them like zigging and yeah, zagging yeah. past, very past exciting. barriers. Very yeah. exciting. It was very exciting. Yeah, well, um, that means that the standings at the moment, or the WTTS standings, Hayden Wilde has actually managed to bump himself up into first, despite coming third. It was enough points, obviously, to leapfrog Vasco Velasha, who is now in second, and Leo Bijer in third. Over in the women's race, well, Cassandra Bogrand did it again. Yep. She took the win ahead of Emma Lombardi in second and Annika Koch in third, meaning that Beth Potter, still holds on to that top spot yep. in the WTCS standings with Sandra Bogrand in second and Taylor Spivey in third. Yeah, and there's two more points races to count in the WTCS Series uh, Championship, uh, and that is obviously the Paris Test event happening in a couple of weeks, and then the Grand Final in Pontevedra a month later. So uh, yeah, two big races to come to decide those champions for the, for the world on points. And then on the Sunday they had the Mixed Team Relay, which, surprise, surprise, <laughs> was won by Team France. <laughs> yeah, they pretty much cleaned up the whole weekend. Uh, they were ahead of Great Britain in second with Team Norway, who's actually done really well lately in the mixed uh, relays, uh, running out the podium in third. It goes 
it just continues on our conversation about the strength of the Norwegian team. Yeah, exactly. And, and shows are, you what Gustav is up against. Yep, there are gold medals up for grabs in the mixed relay in a year's time too. Yeah. So uh, yeah, very interesting to watch those teams coming together. Yeah, well, we also had Ironman 70.3 main, which we discussed earlier on, uh, Zippergate. Uh, in the women's race, it was Georgia Peroni that took the win there, ahead of Amy Zimmerman in second and Nicole Fakari in third. Yeah, and then on the men's side, Trevor Foley took the win ahead of Gregory Barnaby with uh, Justin Metzler uh, being promoted up to third after Matt Sharp was disqualified for Zippergate. Yeah, uh, we also had Alpe d'Huez triathlon this weekend. Um, in the long course race, it was uh, Jeanne Colon that took the win um, in the women's um, ahead of Petra Egenschviller and Karen Schultheis sorry, in third. <laughs> yeah, and it was an all French affair on the men's side with Nathan Gerber taking the win ahead of Arnaud Guillaume with Clément Grandy rounding up the podium there. Yeah. Um, now we've got a lot of races actually coming up this weekend, some exciting ones too. So first off, we've got the 70.3 European Championships in Tallinn, um, which actually Laura Phillip is heading on over to do, and yeah. Lisa Norden, and amongst many others. Uh, we also have got 70.3 Dinia over in Poland and Challenge London, the new course. Well, it's not yeah. a new course actually, sorry. It's an old course, but they now have brought... It's been taken over by Challenge and they brought in a middle distance event. Yeah, it is the London Triathlon, the, the iconic London Triathlon that has been happening for many, many, many years. And now it's got a middle distance and it's called Challenge London and definitely be exciting to watch. Sam Lidlow said he was going to be on the start. I've heard, but he apparently is, yeah. he is still struggling with his calf injury. So ah. it remains to be seen uh, what kind of form he is and or if he's even on that start line. But there's also a really big race happening over in the US. It is the PTO US Open. Uh, it is a big one. Um, Unfortunately, there's been a few last minute withdrawals uh, on that race. Yeah, so we've got Martin Van Riel, who I was really excited to watch race. I just, I really do think he's suited to the long distance former pole, particularly 70.3. He's a very, very strong biker. And um, yeah. yeah, unfortunately, bad news. He is out. Uh, he posted, I dropped my chain and went over my handlebars on a training ride, flying straight into a lantern pole with my back. Five bruised ribbed and a fractured scapula are the verdict. Although the physical pain is bad, the mental pain is a lot worse. Yeah. The PTO races were definitely my A races this year, um, and he had not been as excited for racing in a long time. So this is very frustrating. And for him. he's also having just come back from injury anyway, so it was really just sort of starting to build back in with some improvements in some of the D WTCS races. That's a real shame. We've also got Ruth Assel. Um, she was actually just recovering from one calf injury. She's now got another calf injury yeah. on the other calf. Um, so she's having to rein things back in yeah. and rehab and figure out what's going on there. She was another wild card that was put in and then promptly has had to pull out. Ellie Brownlee, uh, as uh, we've said last week, he had to pull out. He didn't do the Lake, I mean Lake Placid as last chance to qualify for Nice. Uh, he's also not going to be starting in the PTO US Open, he basically said he's not yet fit enough to race and he will only race when he is fit enough to race, uh, so watch the space. Yeah, we also, we also, on the women's side, we also got Chelsea Sodaro and Laura Phillip. Uh, Laura Phillip, not necessarily pulling out because of an injury or anything, um, she is very much still set to race this weekend, as I've mentioned already, yeah. um, but she will not be racing at PTO She's US Open. not taking Open. that flight across the pond. And then, yeah, Rach McBride was the other one who we know is not going to be starting. Hopefully there won't be any more withdrawals before this uh, Friday and Saturday when the race is happening. Those races happening at 10 p.m. UK time on Friday night and Saturday night, uh, which I think is 4 p.m. Milwaukee time. Uh, yeah, so you can watch those. Tune into the PTO website, Eurosport in Europe. Uh, definitely going to be some exciting racing, even with and, all those. And don't forget the GCN Plus app as well. Oh, in the GCN Plus app, yeah. <laughs> Our own app you can watch the races on. Um, and yeah, it's quite an exciting course. On the, It was obviously a 2K swim, 80K bike, and an 18K run. On the swim, it's actually a two-lap course, so two lots of one-kilometer loops of an Australian exit, so it makes it quite fun. Yeah. And then on the bike, it is actually a kind of fast out and back course. It's seven laps, I believe, on the yeah. bike, um, sort of 11-ish Ks each lap. Um, so that's going to be quite an interesting one. And then the run is eight, five laps of the same course. So um, we'll get a lot of chance to see where the athletes are at and compare one another. Yeah, hopefully some some good coverage there. Uh, I think we'll be tuning in. Are you going to stay up till 10 p.m. to watch? Oh, give it a crack. Yeah, yeah. yeah. give it a crack. All right, now moving on to take a look through some of the photos, videos, everything and anything you guys have sent in to us. Now, for the past month, we've been asking you to send in your broken race photos, those post-race photos where 
you've got nothing. You're finished. You've yep. given it your all. And we're flipping on its head this month for August. We are asking for those pre-race photos, hopefully excited photos, you ready and happy to be there. Yeah, before everything goes tits up and you have a bad day. <laughs> now, hopefully you have a good day, but we want to see the pre-race excitement. So send us those photos. Uh, our first one this week is still from very much uh, Jalar's theme, Ben, he says uh, he was running 10K laps for 24 hours, completed 101 miles in 23 oh. hours and 15 minutes. And yeah, that photo, he's definitely broken at the finish line. In fact, it looks like he's going to be using his running poles for a good few days after that event. <laughs> it's interesting that Continental tires were very much tire, car tire logos in the background are sponsoring the event for a mm. running event. Yeah. Um, Anyway, observation. Got to get to the car, yeah. to get to the race, don't you? Um, yeah, very well done there, mate. Um, and Alison, who found herself at the start of a race that unfortunately never started. Yeah, she wasn't broken at the finish line. She was hot broken at the start line. Uh, after the wildfire smoke rolled in overnight and the race was cancelled 35 minutes before the start. This was obviously at 70.3 Montreal in Canada a few weeks ago. I'm pointing to the most epic finish shoot in North America, crying a little tear. Yeah. This was my second time I was missed out racing here. COVID cancellation the first time and was so disappointed. You can't control the weather though. Maybe next year, try number three. Well, fingers crossed for you at try number three. Definitely. And finally, Celia. I think that's how we say it, Cilia. Cilia. Cilia, yeah. Cilia, who understood August's assignment absolutely 100%. Um, this is from Norway. Um, when the Norwegian long distance champs get hosted in the same event as I'm on 70. Point three at Sandner's. Um, I got to have my 10 seconds of feeling like a pro when they presented the elite field before the start. And there she goes. Yeah, awesome. Nice. Well, remember to use the uploader on screen right now to send us your pre-race photos. It can be the whole group of you just before you start. It can be your supporters. It can be anything from pre-race start uh, that, that kind of sets the mood for your day. Hopefully uh, sets it up well. So send us those photos. Say what? <laughs> right. This week's comment of the week comes from My Bike Is My Happy Place. And this comes under your video, James, where you answer the common questions. Yeah, the most Googled triathlon questions. Uh, we answered most of them, I think, although we probably got enough questions for another video, so watch out for uh, take two on that, the rest of the most Googled questions. Uh, but My Bike Is My Happy Place asked, are triathletes insane? Can't believe that question didn't make the list unless the answer is self-evident. I'm not sure what you mean. Why? Why would triathletes be uh, insane? I don't know what you mean. Anyway, a few weeks back, we took part in the Frog Graham Round, an epic swim-run adventure up over the Lake District. As yeah. evidence that triathletes may be insane. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I was just about to just throw you to our video, but anyway. Uh, anyway, that is coming up, um, so stay tuned. That's going to come this weekend. That's 80, what was it, sorry, 80K? It was 68 kilometres running over the fells in the Lake District with 4,000 metres of elevation gain. Yep. S running in our wetsuits up over the peaks, is four we, swims yep. in our running shoes, carrying all our gear. Basically, we did a big loop where you had to swim across the lakes, run over all the mountains uh, in wetsuits. It's the most epic swim run FKT that there is, and Mark dragged Heather and myself <laughs> around it. I would say we were willing participants, we were at the start anyway, but Mark got us around, well, tune in and watch the video, because yeah. it's epic. I think I got you around, I think you're, you're still with me. It's it's just epic. Epic. Anyway, yeah, stay tuned for that, it's coming this weekend. I hope you've enjoyed today's show, if so, please do give it a thumbs up, give it a like, and don't forget to subscribe. And speaking of insane triathlon, things and tri insane triathletes. Uh, Heather and Mark did a pretty insane triathlon where they rode all the way to the Croy Triathlon, which is what, 180 kilometers from yeah. here? Yeah, into a stonking headwind. <laughs> and then uh, camped the night in a, a little bivy tent because they backpacked their way there and then did the triathlon uh, and to ride back home. Tempted to ride him, yeah. yeah, yeah, uh, right. yeah well, that's up on the channel right now if you're looking for something to watch because, uh, yeah, there, there's actually quite a lot of evidence that triathletes might be insane, Mark. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe, he's, maybe. Maybe, maybe he's got a point maybe there. Anyway, point. thanks for watching. We'll see you again next week.